Hi, everyone. Welcome to Chapter 4, Day 2. Does everyone know that's where we're at? Sorry, we're, things are very fluid with book group, and I think that's good, don't you? <laughs> yeah. And it's a meaty chapter, isn't it? Like, there's a lot in it, and I thought it would be good to have a second day on it, even though we, we covered a lot in Kyabra. Has anyone had the chance to listen to what, or watch what happened in Kyabra? Okay, so quite a few of you. That's awesome, yeah. Yeah, it was fun to have a discussion with a different group. They were really enthusiastic. And um, how do you guys all feel about me shifting to Kyabra for a week? I thought it was beautiful. Yeah, I felt really excited to offer them that gift because, for you know, they're tuning in long distance and they don't have that experience. So. They really felt a part of it. They did. They felt a part of it and they just went for it. <coughs> yep. Full force, so yeah, that was good. Okay, well, will we just launch into some of your reflections on chapter four? Um, if for those of you who've watched and listened, it's very disconcerting having you in low lights. Actually, I can't make very good eye contact with any of you. But yeah, but anyway, the lights will come up in a minute. Um, at the beginning of the discussion last week, I talked a lot about how deeply I reflect on each chapter. And some of you will have seen what I do in my book. You know, I create the two columns and I write the truths that I find. And then I, like, I reflect on every truth with how that, how that relates to my life. And it ends up being quite a lengthy exercise, but I feel really... Um, really beautiful and it helps me realise a lot of things and the way that um, Fred has told his story is that there's meaning inherent in just about every sentence. So I really tried to emphasise that for all of you guys. That's all right. <laughs> um, just to let you know how, how deep it is possible to go with this book if you want to. So. Um, what did you guys think about those who saw the discussion last week? What did you think? What were your feelings about it? No thoughts? Diana? Um, I just thought the group there was wonderful and all the, all the comments that they made were, were really like honest and open and um, I, I just gained so much from listening to them. Yeah, yeah, it was good. They had a bit of Fred spirit, didn't they? Yeah. Asking and wanting to know, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Karen? If you just keep your hand up, Nina can see you. It's just because the lights are a bit low. You had a bit of a discussion on the, the talents parable. Yes. Um, and there was a question... Well. It, Something I have about the talents that didn't come up in that discussion. Um, yeah. So would you like to briefly summarise the parable of the talents for those people who didn't get to see the discussion last week? Okay. It's about a uh, wealthy man who is going away somewhere and he gives three servants different responsibilities and different um, amounts of money yes. for them to um, do the best with while he's gone. Yeah. And the first one um, does very well, invests it, and when the, when the wealthy man comes back, he's able to give him the return with a lot of interest. The second, who had less, does the same. Mm -hmm. So he's, the, both of them are praised and given rewards for that. The third one so said, well, my master is a hard man and I don't want to do anything wrong. So I'll bury my talent, and when he comes back, I'll be able to give it back to him. Yeah. Um, and so he was uh, not. Uh, it, it was. It was. The, the moral of the story was that's not what you should do. <laughs> um, yes. That that God rewards those who take uh, risks with what they've been given, or who desire to um, use what they've been given in a positive way. Yeah. 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 So your question. And, and you you did in that in Kyabra talk about the fear yep. that the third man had. Um, but I have to say that in my life I've got a, a fear that that talent has kind of like been a weight on my shoulders all my life really, that story. Yep. Um, because it feels like I've been given many talents and I better blooming use them otherwise I'll be in big trouble. And it's, it's, it's really been 
like the guiding darkness of my life in a way. So. Which is similar to, I think, what Elaine shared at the time. She said oh. when she'd read it in Bible group years ago. Was that right, Elaine? Yeah, it, it seemed like, oh my gosh, yeah, I'm in trouble. Mm. So, so what's your question, Karen? I really was thinking that I didn't realise that that had been addressed. I just thought, oh, these people are seeing those things. Um, I suppose there isn't a question, it's just that I sure. have a fear. Yeah. So the feeling is like that it's not a just system? Is that the feeling that you're saying? Um, I, think it, I think it highlights how, how I must see God as a terribly punishing God. Yeah. 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 So instead of seeing that we've been given gifts by God and given the opportunity to use them, and actually the returns that we receive are, we really ret we receive them. Like the man who hid the talent under the ground because mm. he lived in fear, it wasn't, he didn't have a return because he didn't do anything. So, how can I explain this well? If we see God as a punishing God, because remember the third man, he listened to what everyone else said about his master. And everyone else said, oh, he's a punishing guy, you know, you better give him back what he's given you. And so he lived in fear of that state and he, he buried his talent. When the guy got back, he said, oh, here you go, he's the talent. And what I feel about that story is that um, what we're being shown is that if we live in fear, there is, like, it's like a penalty on our soul. And, and you're saying, I understand, you're saying that makes me feel like I should be afraid. But remember also what we learn from Fred all and from his friends in the spirit world all the way through this um, story is that any penalty upon our soul is not punishing. It's there for the purpose of um, correction and teaching us. So if you view it from that viewpoint, can you see that it's really just your own anxiety about not wanting to be corrected and not wanting to, um, actually not wanting to use what you have for fear of what will happen that makes you feel like this is not fair? Can you see what I mean? I, I, I feel that I do use what I have, but it's never enough and I should do it more and that well, maybe it's the same thing. But So... Do you feel that God feels that way, or do you feel that you feel that way? Um, I, I guess in my heart I feel that God feels that way. In my head I know that's not true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, I think that that is just um, highlighting to you some feelings that you have from your parents about being punished for not being good enough, yeah. uh, which is very different to what we're learning about God, which is that he doesn't punish us for not being good enough, but if we live in fear, there's an automatic penalty upon our soul. Do you yeah. see, see where I'm at? Yeah. I, yeah. As I think I shared in Kyabra, when I read that story first, I had this same sort of feeling like, oh, I'm going to be punished <laughs> if, I don't, um, if I don't actually act in my life. And the truth is that God, there is a penalty if we just live in fear all our life. Um, but because I'm so afraid of acting and then getting it wrong or acting and it, you know, not, or somebody else punishing me, then I want to justify this position of living in fear and burying my talent. So my actual punishment is what I'm doing to myself now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Lorleen? Is, that, is this about the talents as well? Yeah. yeah. Um, it just made me reflect about what talents means um, in terms of if I, if I refer it to that question, do I know how to love? Because that's what we've been given. And I've always used the excuse, I don't know, so I don't do it. Yes. And um, it was the fear of doing it wrong. But when I've taken on that, yes, I can, and even if I gradually learn what's more loving... Um, I'm, I'm sort of allowing myself to take what God's given me, but otherwise I keep saying, no, I'm afraid I don't think I know how to love. Yeah. So I use that excuse to hide it. Yeah. And then I say, well, God, I didn't know how to love because I was never taught. And that 
is just the, the punishment, or you might refer to as, as my decision to listen to everyone else because they told me this, they told me that. And that's what I've been doing, always listening to everybody else yep. and not taking my own counsel. Yep. That's what I referred to before, but I refer to it again now, just listening to Karen yes. you know, about yeah. how I could use not even necessary talents as my abilities, but just the very fact of loving and being afraid to love and how would that be and open myself to it and being vulnerable and all those things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's amazing what fear will, like what excuses we can generate out of our state of fear, isn't it? You know, oh, no, I can't. Oh, no, yep. Oh, I, do, I don't have enough to give anything away. Or, you know, all these things are actually just fear-driven ideas. And that's what I feel the story is showing us, that talents can represent money, as like a talent in the story is money. It can represent the, the talents we have inside of ourselves. So the any gift that God has given us, which really includes money and anything in our unique personality that we can offer, but also love, as you say, Lorleen. And very often I feel that, I mean, what I feel about the way God has designed this universe is that if we act in a good intention, we're going to learn about love. And while we hold back saying, oh, I can't because I don't have enough, or I can't because I'm not good enough, or I can't because I don't know how to properly, we dis completely disengage with God's process of how, we, how he built us to grow, which is actually to act in our desire and to have that desire refined by his laws. Yeah, yeah, so it's good points. Ellen, <laughs> are we still on the talents? Yeah, awesome. Um. I'm just realizing that uh, maybe for me, like I was in so much fear all my life that it seemed like all I can do with the gifts and the talents was to not harm with them. Like, you know, I was trying to not harm anybody and not, not do anything wrong, but like to me it was almost too much. I thought it was too much of God to ask for me to actually do something positive. Yeah, yeah. And now I'm realizing that it's like a, you know, it's an opportunity, and like you've been saying about our fear, sometimes it's acting that's going to... That's going to... Really, the only way to... Because the fear is like a false belief in us, and the only way we're going to get through the fear is to act to challenge that belief and have the truth enter us. Um, so we've been talking a lot about processing fear, the three of us, in the last couple of weeks, and uh, talking about how we can sit and try to process our fear, but we really have to act in order to challenge the false belief to be free of the fear. Yeah, so, yeah, it's yeah, So a good I point think we can raise. see it more as an opportunity, a gift of, that God is giving us to, you know, to go beyond, but not he's going to punish, you know, not so much like a fear of punishment if I don't do something, you know, great. Exactly, exactly. So. And it's about the intention, isn't it? The, remember, God sees everything. So he sees what we do that's in error and what it's not, but he also sees what intention we have as we do it. And he weighs all of those things, that judgment hall that um, Fred was fearing. And um, I think Helen told him, you know, it's already done. It's already over. God's seen everything that's inside of you. So God's going to see if you go, okay, God, I've got this intention to give love right here. And I'm going to launch into it with my whole heart. And oh, I stuffed it up okay, thanks for that correction, I'm going to go for it again, you know. But when we live in fear, we go, oh, I couldn't even possibly just try because it could be wrong. And, and then what's going to happen? And, and this is where all our beliefs about the punishing God limit us as well, which is often a lot about punishing parents, isn't it, well, that we've transposed onto God. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. Does anyone else have any... Do you kind of understand where we're at around the talents and... Um, Yep, that's pretty clear. Does anyone else have any reflections on that? No? Okay. So on that um, idea of the punishing God, I suppose, because in this chapter, um, what, was the, what was the bit that stood out to you the most in terms of emotional triggers or things that, well, I really need to pay attention here? Rochelle? Um, it was the woman who saw the brother and sister hugging. Okay. She was in the reddish brown robe and yep. she was in terror just witnessing them. The mother, she was their mother. The, their mother, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And um, yeah, just the realisation by her not willing to face what she'd done to them. 
she was in terror and wanted to get away from them. Yeah. And it just triggered me into, like, with you and AJ, stuff that I've done to you guys projected and just not wanting to be around you because of my shame. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think I talked in Kayaba about this this realisation I'd had when I was reading it about when I want to avoid the people that I've harmed and avoid the emotions associated with that, I just... I consign myself to a hellish condition. I, it can't be any different. That's the way God's designed it. So it was very motivating for me to face a lot of things, yeah. as I think for a lot of people in Kyabra, yeah. 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 So it just helped me to connect with why am I blocking the truth in terms of I have actually done wrong. God's been showing me this through movies and everything. Yeah. And just having to work through the blocks of why won't I admit that I've actually done harm. Yeah. And then realising oh, my God, I have done harm, and then going through the repentance and the, yeah, and it feels so different now, just even being in the room with you guys. And, awesome. Yeah, yeah, but it was just that stood out the most yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, Great. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? What, what was the... Did anyone have a different point? Gary? When I read that thing, I thought it was the, the mother and son and the girl was his, his girlfriend. Right. So that's why she was the punishing mother of the girlfriend, so she might have done something to it. Right. That's, that's how I took it, but yeah. maybe that's my uh, experience. <laughs> well, it was actually the daughter. It was, was a brother it? and sister, yeah, right. embracing, and it was their mother who came upon them. But obviously the mother had done things to harm her children, um, but her daughter offered her this gift of forgiveness, yeah. What does what does it really mean to forgive someone? How how do we how are we forgiven someone? Lorraine? <laughs> yep, you have to move, Nina. <laughs> um, um, for me, it's when I really feel uh, what I've. Um, what, what's been happening to me? You mean to forgive someone? Yeah. yeah. How, would, how would you forgive me if I'd done something to harm you? Um, when I f have felt the grief of exactly what's been happening, I, I, it's sort of like a total understanding of why it all happened and that it, there is no blame, there is nothing. Because when you get down to feeling everything that it is involved in, it's just like it's... Um, just the grief and then when it's over it's like that there's nothing really to forgive so it just goes into oh I understand and that in understanding is like a compassion and that compassion is like a forgiveness yeah 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 I don't yep. know if you have to actually take an act and say I forgive you I thought that it came with it as it comes down to the very core of it yeah I feel it's something that happens naturally when I when I allow myself to fully feel all of the harm that's being done to me. So I don't... A lot of people um, have the feeling that... Well, on the natural love path, what is it to forgive? How do I forgive someone on the natural love path? Oh. <laughs> Rita? On the natural love path, it has never happened. It was just an illusion. But what... How do you... <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> But who, who has been on the natural love path for a long time and can tell me what you, what you would usually say to, in order to forgive someone? Diana, we go to you. Um, I'd usually rationalise it away and I would say, it's okay, I understand why, you, you know, and, and that's all right and, and I forgive you and yep. let's so, just forget about it. So on the natural love path, I try to understand you and what you've done, the reasons why you've done it, mm -hmm. and then I deny all of my pain and I go, I forgive you. Yeah. That's, that's really how... Do you agree? That's how we're kind of trained to do it. On the divine love path, the way we forgive is by act doing almost the opposite initially, where we, we don't try to understand that person yet. We just allow ourselves to feel all of the pain, and I believe this is the only way to truly forgive it from a heart place, to feel all of the pain of what was done to us. So sometimes that starts with anger as we're resisting the pain, and then we feel all of the pain of what's been done, and we allow ourselves to fully grieve it. We ask God for the truth about what's happened to us, and God can tell us, yes, you were hurt in this way and this way and it affected you this way and all the different ways and we allow ourselves to grieve it. And once that is all gone out of us, 
then, as Lorleen points out, this feeling of naturally comes. We've, we've honoured our own pain enough and loved ourselves enough to release it. Then this feeling comes of, oh, I do actually understand why that person did that. And I can have compassion for them. I'm not carrying anything about it anymore. And I can forgive them. And in this way, I see that forgiveness is like freedom for us. It means we're not we're not carrying the weight of anything. And it also allows us to give this gift. And this is what this girl was giving to her mother. If, and if you think about that, that's a pretty incredible thing, isn't it? It's an amazing gift to give. Uh, and Yusmos points out that that is something that is going to help her greatly in her, um, in her future path. Uh, Geraldine, you had a question about that? Yeah. Uh, Maybe it's not so much a question but a comment um, and that is that I think that it's an oversimplification to say how it is on the, the natural love path because there are so many different paths that would come under that heading and in sure. my experience um, there are some paths that I've followed that definitely go into it in a, in a much more detailed way and that are to do with... Um, recognising that you're carrying uh, emotions about it and um, it's that it is definitely a matter of working through those emotions until you're, um, till you're not carrying the resentment and the anger anymore and dealing with the grief and things like sure. that. Sure. Yeah. So can I say then, um, if I reference the divine love path as the path that involves your soul. So in that under that definition, what you're describing is something that actually involves your soul, yeah. not just your intellect. Yeah, so totally. I would put that under that heading. And I agree, perhaps it's an oversimplification to say the natural love path. Uh, mm. Perhaps I should have said the way we were taught to forgive in our childhoods mm. for the majority of us was about this understand the other person, deny my own pain, forget about it. And then at Christmas time, go around and go, oh, okay, there's still a lot going on here for me. Understand them, forget about my pain. Oh, I forgive you again, Mum. You know, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Mary, can I share something else um, is about it this? Related um, to this? Yeah. Um, and that is um, another thing that can help me work through the... Um, to a forgiveness is if I'm feeling angry with someone for how they've treated me and um, if I pray about it and uh, for, uh, this happened to me recently for instance it felt like a quite a big hurt that I had and I felt very angry and I prayed for humility and I came around to feeling um, to seeing that I'm completely capable of doing that same thing that I have that same error that same injury that causes me to to have similar behaviour, yeah, and um, so that helped me to um, actually I came out of it feeling a lot more compassionate for the both of us, yeah, um, and 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 also it sort of just set me on a, a different um, trajectory um, where I could start f feeling the the pain of well actually of of i had some um remorse come up for me about how i treat other people in that similar way yeah so can i just i think i understand what you're saying yeah um i feel this is a really important thing to talk about actually because um a lot of what i've been talking to you guys about in the past few weeks, month, has been about um, having compassion and care for each other. And, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about what does it mean to actually love and, you know, not stand in judgment of other people. And I feel that um, that's a really important quality to develop inside of ourselves. However, when we're feeling about harm that's being done to us, it can be tempting to um, avoid that harm by saying, well, I'm just like that. So, you know, and I, so therefore we distance ourselves from what, what's been done to us because we think, oh, well, I could do that. And so it, it is actually often a way to avoid repentance. I'm not saying that that's necessarily what happened here because sometimes we think, oh, 
Raj kicked me. Uh, well, I, I could probably kick Raj. I'd better just avoid that whole issue, you know. So, Raj, it's hard for both of us, isn't it? We've got this kicking tendency, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, I'll have compassion for you, you might understand me and we'll get over it. The truth is, I have to feel that, Raj right, kicked me. That really hurt. Actually, I feel a lot of grief about that. Now, in that process, I might come to the, to the point where I go, oh my gosh, God, and I feel like I could kick as well. And wow, now this is taking me into some deep repentance. But when I do the first thing where I just go, oh, Raj kicked me, but oh, gee, I could probably kick Raj. I better, I, sorry, it's, it, can you see it's almost a complicit thing where I say, it's too hard for me to deal with my kicking tendency, so I won't ever expect Raj to deal with his, and I'll distance myself from the pain of him kicking me. Whereas when, I, you know, when I'm going to forgive, I'm never going to avoid the pain of what's happened to me. Just like when I repent, I'm never going to avoid the pain of what I've done to somebody else. Can you see where I'm going? Is that clear? Yeah, because that's quite important. Because often a way that we were taught um, through however we were brought up, I know it was taught to me, is like, oh, you're wounded by that person, see that wound in yourself. And then, you know, it all kind of became a bit distancing and it, it kind of got me away from my soul, which is I hurt they hurt, we all hurt, but we have to feel it all, you know. And by saying, oh, I could do the same thing, sometimes it can be a, a sort of a, a false compassion. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks for bringing that up, Geraldine. Uh, Barbara? Um, I need some clarification or understanding on that um, very point when she was um, forgiving of her mother. Yeah. I not only um, heard it intellectually, I actually felt the beauty in that um, experience. Yeah. And then when um, Us Usmos, is it? Us Usmos, Usmos, I Usmos, say. I don't know um, that's talked right. about the light that went to her and yep. she would carry that with her and yep. that would assist her in her healing. Yeah. Is the act of forgiveness from the daughter to the mother give, give light to the mother... That stays with her. I need a bit of explaining on it, okay? So my understanding of it was that that light stayed with her until she desired herself to, to feel that, what she had caused. And that light, though, because it's with her as a reminder, when she was ready, would greatly assist her to move forward. Yeah. Well, forgiveness is a gift. And what this chapter shows us is that it's a real gift. It's a real thing. Just like in the spirit world, it's much more open and clear that love is a real thing that flows to somebody. It's a substance. And this forgiveness that she's given is a gift of love. And so at the state that she's in, we can feel that she's very shut down, isn't she? She's running away. She wants to hide from what she's done. So her daughter has given her this gift and it's with her now, but she's not ready to open to, to any of that. Because remember in other weeks I've said that I've, um, that while we're, while we're shutting down our pain, we're also shutting down our ability to feel other emotions, like mm -hmm. love, um, coming to us or being in us oftentimes. So she's, she's ignoring all of that. She doesn't want to feel it. Once she opens and feels she wants to actually have feelings about what she did to her daughter and feel the repentance about that, then that forgiveness she will receive like an overwhelming gift. Wow, I, I know what I did to this girl, this person I viewed as my daughter, and she loves me. She loves me in spite of this. And um, that's pretty powerful. Like if you think about that in terms of God does that for us. When we're willing to open to the truth of what we've done, remember the Holy Spirit connects to us through truth. When we're willing to be open and truthful about what we've done or what's been done to us oftentimes, then his love can enter us. And it's a, it's a very similar gift. Her gift is not as huge as God's, obviously, but it's very real. And because she's actually the person that the mother harmed, can you feel how powerful that would be? It was very powerful. I felt that, yeah. indeed. So that, that gift that she's given her and that, that light that sits with her, once she opens up, the, the metaphor is that that light would lighten her heart as well, lighten within her. Yeah, well... That's how I took it, but... 
Um, yeah, I don't even feel it's quite metaphorical as really a real thing. <laughs> like God's love entering us, um, often that triggers more of our grief because <laughs> we feel the lack of the love. And for her, I feel that when she's willing to open up and feel what she's done to her daughter, then she'll feel the love of her daughter and that will possibly trigger more grief, <laughs> but that will assist her greatly. So it's really about giving the gift of forgiveness, which is a gift of love, and the effect that our giving love has on other people. Um, and I feel that's, you know, th that's a really beautiful thing that I'm reflecting on lately, just in general, is about how this gift of love, when, I, when it's given to me, how much it just, you know, it's so healing. And what opportunities do I take to give it to other people? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mary. No worries. Thank you. Raj? <coughs> Just if you wait for the mic, yeah. Um, there's this little beautiful four words in here, terror makes their hell. Yeah. Which is really what you're saying about being able to extend love through forgiveness because you can alleviate somebody's terror or at least assist them in that. Uh, I'd, I'm not sure if that's... I mean, everyone's terror must be faced by themselves, mm -hmm. you know? So I feel more that once she faces her terror... Of, she's really terrified of facing herself, isn't she? Mm -hmm. And that's yep. what's creating her hell. And I actually feel like the gift of her daughter's forgiveness will not be fully received by her until she faces that terror to face herself, mm -hmm. and then that gift will be able to be received by her. At the moment, if you can imagine it, she's like trying to avoid herself the whole time and she's terrified of facing it. And it's the same with, uh, with us with God, isn't it? You know, oh God, I don't want to see that part of me. I don't want to see that part of me. I don't want to see that part of me. But God wants us to face our fears. When we do, then you go, oh, thank goodness you're aware of yourself. Now I can give you more love. And so I, I feel that it's more about that. I think love never... Um, I think when we love, we offer truth always. And sometimes that reduces people's fear. You know, as Fred entered the spirit world, someone said to him, it's okay, this is a land of surprises, but everything's governed by love. And he just went, oh, okay, I don't Sorry. have to fear anything. So that was given the truth. But for this lady, really the truth is, you're terrified because you, want, you don't want to face yourself, but you're going to have to face yourself, sister, in order to grow. So um, sometimes that might enhance her terror for a while until she's willing to face it, yeah. yeah it does say up the top, you know, that, that light will remain with her until she's paid the penalty. Yeah, so. yeah, which is about the repentance process, yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome, okay. Was there more, Rad? No? <laughs> Lizzie? I was going to speak as it came through, but then yeah. it went across there in this little corner. Um, so would she feel then... Um, there was almost a feeling for me when she walked away of, of shame and guilt and, and all of those emotions. Yes. All, I could almost feel her head hanging really, really low and just slowly and not knowing where she was going and just feeling really lonely. And um, So how long would... Uh, so what I'm saying is the gift is this forgiveness, which surely is wrapped in love. Yeah. Well, so it's made she, of love, isn't it? Well, it's made of love. Yeah. So, and this gift she's taking with her for however long she has to do this, this penalty. But what I can't understand is love is the greatest healer in all things. Yeah. So why couldn't she, uh, why couldn't there be more healing rather than her going away the way well, I felt that she did? Beautiful question. Does anyone know the answer? Oh. Suzanne, if you just pass to Suzanne. Because when she had the opportunity, she couldn't, she couldn't bear it. She couldn't stand the love. And yeah. She couldn't receive it. And yeah. they said she had the moment there where she could have just really been humble and let go yeah. and let them love her, and she just couldn't do that. Yeah. Too much pride, perhaps. Yeah. Or too much fear of just yeah. shame or all those things. Yeah. Just So, yeah, so that's, that's what I see, is that God is lovingly creating this opportunity for her to face herself, and she doesn't want to take it. And remember, everything in God's universe is geared towards desire. You know, when we desire growth, bam, it's there. You know, we're given more opportunities for it. When we desire love, woof, it comes, you know, when it's true desire. So I feel that she had the opportunity there and her daughter offered her the gift of love and she, she wasn't ready yet. Mm. And so she, she stayed with her emotions 
can anyone else feel the similarity between us and this woman? <laughs> Dies like, oh my gosh, so much. <laughs> um, you know, so she stayed like trying to protect herself. She thinks she's, she's in terror. She thinks she's protecting herself when really there's this love all around her. And Yusma says to Fred, she's actually going somewhere that's the most loving for her right now. It's just going to make her the most comfortable until she really desires something different. And then the minute she just even has the first desire, bam, someone's there to help her. So... Um, you know, I feel that about God, like God loves us immensely and God wants our healing and growth and this relationship with us. But he's like, my hands are tied until you want it. I can't do much. I, when I say I can't do much, he's like doing so much. He's got all of these laws operating in the universe, you know, that are giving us food and shelter and opportunities and natural love and all these other things. But he's saying, I can't do the personal relationship bit, guys, until you want it. And so it's just, a, it's just an analogy about desire, I think, or an example about desire. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. If we go to Di and then to Graham behind her. Yeah. Um, it makes me think too more about how God, we're like that with God, with God's yeah. love and yeah. God's forgiveness is there waiting for us to feel. Yeah. So, but, you know, all my injuries, my fear and my belief in punishment are still so strong that, yeah, yeah I just don't allow that to happen yeah. very often. Very true, Di. I feel that about myself as well. There's so many things that I'm, you know, holding myself on a rack about when... I, I know the truth that God's already forgiven me. He just wants me to open to, to the truth <laughs> and I can feel that forgiveness. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty incredible gift. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if we just go behind you to Graham. Hi, Graham. <laughs> Hi, Mary. Um, do you think when she turned around, when she was up the, the more loving path yeah. and went back that she was fully aware that that was the more loving path? Could she have rationalised it to herself that, oh, this, this one's terrible, uh, feels horrible up here, she might go off and then bad mouth it to all her friends, don't go up that one, that's horrible up there, you feel really lousy up that one. Yeah, you know? uh, I think that's highly likely. I don't know if she, maybe she didn't think about it that much, but it's very, you know, she's just received this massive gift of love from her daughter and she can't feel it. And she's walking in this way towards this higher condition of love and it's triggering all her pain, just as love does. It triggers our pain, uh, which is the opportunity God's inbuilt in us to release it and then receive. And, but it just makes her feel more uncomfortable. And, and so I think it's very likely. And again, can we see the analogy often in our lives when we go into something where there's actually more love, it feels more alien and it feels more... Um, frightening sometimes like when someone's really truthful with us um, and often even if it's a very loving truth if someone's saying oh I really love this thing about you you know it's just an awesome quality you've got inside of you and I just see you doing it here 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 and here sometimes that's enough to make me want to run and hide it you know, if I don't want to cry about the fact that that's hardly been said to me before, you know, the pain of that, then I can think, well, I don't hang out with those people. They're always just like, I've heard guys say that. Everyone's just talking about emotions and, you know, it just feels bad. <laughs> yeah. So I agree, Graham. It's possible that that's what she felt. Yeah. Can you see how as well that unless we're really humble, it's hard for us to discern what's loving and what's not? Because sometimes we can go down a track that's actually very unloving and it feels bad. But, you know, and that is the truth. And when we're humble, we'll feel that. We'll go, oh, okay, this, that person's nasty. Whoa, that person's angry. That person's attacking. That person's a rapist. Oh, my gosh, like, this feels really bad. And I can feel all this. And there's God's built, inbuilt radar in me to say, I need to turn around. <laughs> But oftentimes I've seen myself go down many paths or on reflection I've gone down many paths because I'm really shut down and I just want approval. So I end up hanging out with anyone who will give me approval and sometimes they're really not very nice but I, can't, I don't want to feel anything. I just want to feel, I just want someone to help me stay away from my feelings. Whereas when we're humble, we'll encounter different things like for example her on the path. We'll encounter our daughter. We'll feel something coming from her 
And if we're willing to feel it, it'll open us and we'll go, oh, wow, actually my daughter has developed so much since, you know, she passed obviously before her and that's amazing, you know, I can feel that. And, and now as I'm walking down this path, there's so much beauty and, oh my gosh, it's triggering all my grief about how I felt like that my childhood there was no beauty and I lived a life in poverty and, oh, and I'm feeling, 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 but I can keep walking. But when I'm shut down, I don't... I can't feel it. I can't feel it. discern truth very well at all. Yeah. Mm. Tara. Hello. Hi. So um, it's true then that children are innately forgiving all the time, and but slowly it starts to shut down, and as the errors come in. So this daughter was forgiving for her mum. Um, I don't feel that she was innately forgiving. I feel, and this is what I wanted to highlight to you guys, I feel she passed and she had to work through this process that we discussed earlier yeah. to the point where she was able to offer this really pure gift to her mum. So, so a little child, you know how people say our children are always very forgiving as our dogs, you know, our pets mm -hmm. are forgiving. Is that true then? Like, or, or there is... If there's something that's done uh, to the child and they well, aren't able to feel that grief, then they can't forgive. They so why is it that children are more naturally forgiving? If they're wanting... Um, oh, why they are naturally forgiving? Um, well, I believe it's... I thought it was like their natural nature, the, nat the natural thing that God okay. gave. Okay, can we just hold for a second and go to Jason and then we'll come back to you? Why do you think they're naturally forgiven, Jason? Because uh, we were created very humble, like to be very humble, so children still have that quality of humbleness. Well, like in the example of Raj kicking... <laughs> Sorry, Raj. It's all right, I've got it in me. <laughs> um, you know... If somebody comes and kicks a child, they're naturally more humble. They'll grieve it, which is the process that we all have to go through about what's how we've been harmed. They'll grieve it, and then they'll be able to forgive as a natural part of themselves. What happens when, you know, a parent does something to the child, they start crying, and then they say, because the, the parent starts feeling guilty, don't you cry, what have you got to cry about? Like, shuts them down immediately inhibited their ability to forgive. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So it's not... If you say it's a part of their nature, I guess it's a part of all our nature to yeah. be humble. It's just that through this experience of life, we often get very far away from that. Yeah. And if we're repetitively hurt, like say in the case of a child who's repetitively abused or put down or whatever, after a while, it's, you know, it's hard for them to keep feeling that grief, keep feeling that grief. You know, these feelings of disillusionment come in because there's there's this other feeling now of I'm trapped. Yeah. yeah. So children always just keep coming back and and um, be as if nothing really harmed them because they're just wanting love. It's not because they've actually forgiven, they're just wanting your love and approval again. Mm. Very often. Yeah. Yeah, very okay. often. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rob? Just an observation that in the story, the younger brother recoils in, in fear and terror, so he couldn't forgive, you know, he yeah. hadn't worked through the process yet. Yeah, he yeah. wasn't there yet. Yeah. 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 So he's possibly displaying some of, you know, what the girl has had to work through. Yeah, the terror definitely. and the grief yeah. of all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It was quite a great example, wasn't it, to show that, Gary? Uh, now that she's received that... Um, forgiveness or a shot of light, mm -hmm. would that sort of and disenable her to reoffend from the spirit world? No. What's the only that thing her, that... Like her awareness of that, the reminder is there on her all the time. So if she's got remind, reminding of it, no. No. <laughs> why, why isn't, why would it prevent her? Well, she's got, she's had forgiveness and she She's got that reminder of that forgiveness with her. Yeah, so and this is a would, really important point. Wouldn't that spark point. something in her, in her mind from the spirit world that she could not just go and, and do that to someone else on earth, the same thing as she's done to a daughter? Okay, let's talk about this in depth. 
The truth is she wasn't willing to receive that gift. When we do offer the gift of forgiveness, that is very powerful and it does have the power to open a person to what it is they have done to us. It does have that power. It doesn't mean they will, like in the story, she, didn't, she wasn't there yet. She wasn't going to do that. But it does have that power. But the only thing that's going to change our soul to stop us from doing some, some harm or wrong that we've done in the past is our repentance. And she hasn't engaged that process of repentance. Mm. And there's something also for you to look at, Gus, like for yourself, there's a lot of issues where you haven't entered this process of repentance. And I feel there's a bit of a feeling in you of like, oh, you know, is there a side alley? (laughs) Because really repentance, remember we talked about those five steps a couple of weeks ago, it's quite a big process. Um, and it's only through the process of repentance that we're going to be able to securely say, I will never do that thing again. Mm. We can use our will a lot to, you know, stop ourselves, but while the injury is in us and then our desire to avoid that injury, which is a great big fear often, and our, desire, and our belief that it's okay to harm another person in fear of looking at that injury... While all those things are still in place within us, it's going to take a lot of will not to do it again. Because remember, our soul is pretty much the biggest force that directs our life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's good. Thanks. No worries. Uh, If we go to Tim and then across to this lady here. Yeah, Uh, yeah, I just had a question about um, God and forgiveness. Um, I just wondered if... um, you are able to feel God's forgiveness even though you might have a belief or a fear that God is a punishing God or that you should receive punishment for what you've done? Well, it's very hard to... That's a good question. I mean, while I'm carrying that belief really strongly that God's going to punish me, it's very likely that I'm going to be blocking God, isn't it? I mean, you can feel that. I feel there's sometimes a point where we reach a level of openness to a level of truth about what we've done on a certain issue and we can be open enough to actually feel God's forgiveness for us and then that can help change that false belief. But that false belief already has to be kind of fairly loosened, I think, you know. We have to have some beliefs about God being loving uh, before we're going to open ourselves that much to God. Um, what does everyone else think? I don't, I don't know the definitive answer to that. I mean, I think it's a good question. I think for myself, I have a lot of fears about being punished, but there has been times where I've reached a place of like total openness around a certain issue for a certain period of time and I've suddenly felt, oh my gosh, God loves me so much and it's all f- like from his perspective it's forgiven and that's, you know, triggered me even more. Yeah, so... Lorleen, what do you think? Um, if, if I feel, um, well, as I understand it, the, the punishing God would be a reflection of how I see my parents and then myself. Yep. So if I feel that I've got to a point where um, I don't feel like I'm... I've, I've felt enough emotion has been released to feel I'm not punishing anymore. I don't transfer that feeling of punishment on to other or anyone else because then I could feel I'd never be punishing. I just wouldn't be that way because the love in me wouldn't allow me to. So if I could transfer that, then God definitely wouldn't, you know. But if as long as I held on to anything where it was... uh, where I still felt I had to be punished in some form, I don't know whether I'd let God in to, 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 love, you. to love me totally, even yeah. maybe fractions, but not the real sense of there is no punishing God. Yeah. As long as I held on to that, I think I'd still feel that somewhere underneath yeah. it all. Yeah. yeah. I think it's like this... Um, it feels to me like it's a it's a breaking up of an issue, you know, it's a rock hard issue to begin with and then we start to intellectually challenge some of that belief and then, you know, we start to open up a bit emotionally mm. and then we see some more truths about our parents, our own punishing, uh, oh, maybe God, and, and sometimes like there's a crack and God can get through and give us some love and we feel forgiven and we go, oh, that 
gets away a whole big chunk of me feeling like I deserve to be punished or God's punishing. And then, you know, so I don't feel it's like a magic moment uh, where it all suddenly shifts. But I do feel that God can reach us with his love if we're really open in a moment um, to the truth and a desire for God. So, yeah. I don't know. Suze? It's interesting. I was talking to my daughter-in-law last night on the computer because she's going through a really tough period at the moment. And she wrote me a question and she asked, is it disadvantage to your soul to not tell the truth or be dishonest? And it started a whole dialogue and I realised I had to share with her something that came up in Kyabra. And it's about that we have that internal compass inside us to discern as we go along. And I've gone completely blank. That's all right. Mm-hmm. We can come back to you if you... Yeah. I want to talk about the internal compass, actually. Yeah. That's the second half of what I want to talk about, so... Oh, it's okay. Yep. I've, I've got it again. Um, what I realised is I think that it's a real shame that the word punish is ever connected with God. Yeah. Because it sets up a whole dynamic inside us that really, is really quite frightening. Yeah. And when it comes back to it's only me... And all the punishment will come from my disappointment and my grief inside myself for what I've done. God's got nothing to do with it at all, other than he created the loving laws. To to help me confront what I've done. Not just what I've done and how I feel about it, but what I've done to the other person, how that is, yeah. And how I've been, like this is an interactive universe. Yeah. If, If anything defeats me, it's, I find it's the overwhelm of trying to extrapolate it all out, to understand the complexity of all the things that I've done and then the overwhelm of how will I ever get that all untangled. It's just the biggest mess in the world. Yeah. And if I just come back to just just now, and it feels like I have to relearn everything, remap. I have to learn how to be with emotion. Yeah. I have to stay constant to trusting God and finding faith and it just feels like... Yeah, it's, it's just this great big tangled mess and I can only find one little bit of string at a time and keep working on that. Yeah, yeah. and grow desire, you know. Yeah. To me, that is the biggest thing yeah. that all, all, helps all those, me. All those factors, it's like a recipe and you've just got to keep your eye a bit on all of it and keep well, working it. And I feel, don't be self-reliant in this process. Be God-reliant. Go, okay, God, I can work on desire. You bring me what I need. Because <laughs> God is wanting to, you know. Yeah. There's a beautiful law of attraction at work every second of every day. And if, if I just become God-reliant in the process and say, God, I want to heal myself. I want to heal this soul. I want to see what I've done, whatever it is. And just say, I'll trust that you're going to bring me what I need. And I'll have my eyes open, <laughs> you know, my heart open. Yeah. And then we don't have to rely on ourselves. Hang on. Let's go back to 1972. Right. What was that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Right, one page on that. 73. Okay. (laughs) I I, I think a part of what's happening for me is realising that the reason that my daughter-in-law is having this problem is deeply connected to how I was as a mother. How awesome. And I'm just looking at it and going, oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big gift if you think about it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. To just engage with her from a heart space and just feel what it brings up for you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, true. I'm bleeding. Yep. <laughs> Does anyone have a tissue? Yep. Um, thanks, Suze. Was there anything else? <laughs> if we go to Jane now. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> oh, I'll give it back to you. I could tell you a funny story about shaving my legs, but it's probably not appropriate. <laughs> it's just dorky. I'm a dorky, so <laughs> it's not not risque, <laughs> Jane. Um, I, like I was just wondering, why is it sometimes we can connect to God and have such a strong desire to, you know, want to grow our soul and be connected to God, and then there's other times when we just feel so disconnected. Like I just, I'm sort of struggled to understand that. Like yeah. what, you know, might be good, you know, one day really connected, and then three days later or four days later, it's just hard again to find that connection. I feel it's pretty sad sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. 
I feel the answer is generally fear, Jane. You know, we hit, we hit this place where we, we reach a place of trust, of, of the process, we desire, we, we feel connected to that desire for God and for growth and it opens us and we just allow that and then usually something like a fear, something we still have a resistance to comes up and that's going to happen because God's going, okay, great, you're wanting it, let's have a bit more, you know, and then it's not to like go, oh, I'm terrible, you know, it, it's just like, okay, God's brought me something now that I'm, I'm, still afraid of and the key I find is to go back to that point where you suddenly felt disconnected from this and say what was the fear then right because it can be tempting to just go on for a day another day another day and then just feel down on yourself and feel oh what is this anyway and I but I find if I go back to the point there's usually something that happened an interaction or a point I reached inside of myself where I went, that's too much or I'm quite afraid and I don't want to feel that or now I'm angry or whatever it is and then I detuned because I didn't want to feel that. So I feel that we have the potential to make those periods less and less, you know, because there's fear in all of us at this point, otherwise we'd be at one with God. And so we're going to to reach places where we, you know, oh, wow, this is awesome. I love this path. I love God. I feel kind of connected to God. And then we hit a fear and it's gone. And then we have to work through whatever that fear was and to open into that space again. But potentially we can make those periods in between the open times less and less. If we're just dedicated to looking at what the fear is, growing the desire, going, being honest, okay, I don't have the desire for this yet. Can you help me with that? Because actually now I want to jump off this path because it's, you know, whatever it is that comes up, just be real about it. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Renee? Can I, I just um, like to give an example of um, see, fear came up for me and having to, yeah, I felt my fear come up. Thank yeah, so why don't we leave you with it and also be careful of telling sto- Remember we talked about telling stories per se, like make sure that it's... It was just an exam- a short example around having, um, not feeling punished from God when... You, for me, my experience of recent, even stronger, it's coming in stronger, of when I'm really in my, I start feeling my integrity of um, what I've done to others and the people I might have said something to that wasn't very loving, like a month or two later, they walk into my shop and my, and my stomach starts churning and I'm like, I have to say something to that person. I actually really have to say I'm really sorry for yeah. what I've said or yeah. what I've done. Yeah. And I've noticed it's just really ramped up quite a lot and everywhere I'm going now, these people that don't even live here are walking past me in the street. So that's showing you that there's more of a desire now to face what you've done. There, yeah. Yeah, which is good, hey? And that, that conscience part of us where we can become sensitive again you're desiring that more and it's giving you more opportunities yeah that's awesome. awesome i just want to, yeah. yeah okay anyone else on that forgiveness topic cuz i wanted to yep sandra yeah um what tim said um you know how about god being punishing and and that whole question that we're raising at the moment it feels like when there's repent when you're feeling repentant automatically fears start to trigger, to be triggered. So automatically I feel like that fear of being punished, which is the what I'm projecting out God as a punishing God, gets released a little bit, and then that's when that window of opportunity arises. So it feels like, for me, from my own experience, whenever I engage the process, fear gets automatically triggered through that process. So then the punishment, sort of, I feel that there's forgiveness in that. Do you know what I'm trying to say? In, Not in a quite, way? no, okay. sorry. So just like the feelings that get engaged when we want to be repentant. Yeah. Automatically the fear of being punished gets processed through that. It, for me, it just feels that way that it gets triggered. So therefore, that window of opportunity for, for, to feel God, that God has forgiven me for something, happens because of the desire for repentance in the first place. Yeah. If we have a strong enough desire to repent, yeah. we'll face a lot of fears. 
Yeah. yeah not just that one, you know. Yeah. Because remember, it's largely based on our fear and our justification of the fear that we've been able to hurt someone in the first place. Yeah. yeah. So through repentance, we're going to face a lot of fears. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so that's yeah. kind of like how I feel about Tim's question is that, you know, having this punishing... And so every time we do that, we learn more about God not being punishing... And that's how we learn about yeah. the love of God for yeah. us. And it's really beautiful. When we engage God's process, we learn all about yeah. God and ourselves. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Anything else on the forgiveness topic? Because I want to talk about the really meaty part of the chapter. There's an even meatier part. What? Where is it? Come on, guys. I thought this would be pretty... Uh... We did talk about it at Kyabra quite a bit, but I just wanted to talk about it a little bit more today. It's on page 38 and 39 of the written book, of the bound book. Yeah. It's about, it's about the, um, the responsibility for our sin. Every man shall give an account, yeah. So did anyone have any questions about that section? We talked about it a bit, as I said, last week. David? Thanks. Um, it says somewhere about deliberate sin and then... Um, Ignorance exacts no penalty, which I thought would not be the case. Yeah, well, perfect. Thanks for bringing it up. Oh. <laughs> Let's talk about that. We talked about it a bit in Kyabra. And we talked about really what, what quantifies ignorance. Because I said that I feel, and I believe it's the truth, that God has built in us a natural um, radar for love. <laughs> We're all incarnate yearning it. And we can all feel pretty, you know, pretty strongly when it's off and when it's on. So it's pretty hard to have an ignorance of love. It's the point that I made at Kyabra. But I, I did some more reflecting on it and we had a discussion at home the other night and, and um, I just clarified some of what I felt at a deeper level with AJ and I'd like to share some of that with you now. Because we've all heard about sociopaths. You know, apparently they have no feeling of doing anything wrong, do they? Or, um, you know, people without a conscience. And I believe God built into us a conscience. So the question becomes, how does somebody get to a state where they don't really have a conscience? Well, they can't feel love versus error. Deidre, if we go to someone we haven't been to yet. Um, where they've been abused within an inch of their life. Like... If so, I, yep. go ahead. Can I give an example? Yep. Like Hitler was, um, from what I understand, he was a painter, which is why I kind of like feel a bit of connection or something. But, um, yeah, he was abused terribly by his parents. Yeah. So, in that case, I feel like... Like we were talking to Tara about when someone's hurt and hurt and hurt and they have no ability to deal with that, then very often they have a disconnection very, very strongly from their soul and they're driven by rage or this, you know, very, um, uh, what, what do I want to call it? Um, pun they want to punish back out, it, those kind yeah. of emotions. Yep. So that yeah. can be one example. Yeah. When I was in Kyabra, I talked about this issue of willful ignorance because I said, you know, I feel we all have a conscience, but very often we are willfully ignorant. We decide we don't want to feel what's happened and we decide that we can rationalise it to ourselves or it really wasn't that bad or oh, I didn't know any better and all of those kinds of things. So what do you think happens to a child who is born to parents who are willfully ignorant? What effect would that have on them? Karina? I think they learn the same level of detunement and they take on those false belief systems. 
yeah, it can be very often difficult for them to notice that they're being willfully ignorant themselves because they're born into an environment where things, where, you know, everyone's trying to be ignorant. And so very often if they're conceived and born into that environment, they can have a detunement from, you know, conscience. Now, I actually feel that's fairly rare because I feel most people have a conscience, but they they often rationalise out of it. But very, very most people who, when they've done something, like this morning we were talking about the issue of abortion, most people, even if they rationalise to themselves, it's a woman's right, it's my body, oh, there's no, you know, they're not a real person yet, whatever. Most women, when they have an abortion, often have a pretty big emotional reaction to it and I think that's because they feel inside of themselves hang on there's something not right here so I agree with what you're saying though Karina when someone is very detuned from their feelings so they, they've gone beyond rationalizing to really shutting down emotionally all of these feelings when a, when a child's conceived and born into that place it can be hard for them to in their early years of life to understand right from wrong or loving from unloving. What happens though, do you think? Because remember that God's universe is governed by laws of love. So what would God do in that situation to assist that child? Trevor? The um, law of attraction is going to attract situations that can help the child um, work on those emotions if they're open to it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. God's going to, the law of attraction is going to bring to that child as they grow, as they begin to activate their own will, to help them see the error of their ways, to help them see, oh, hang on, maybe my racism isn't actually just, you know? Someone else is telling me something different. Mum and Dad felt that way, but maybe... Maybe there's an error inside of me. So God's going to be giving them many opportunities, actually, to see that, to become resensitised. So the question is then, where does the penalty lie? Barbara? It lies with the parents until the child's in a position where they start acting out with their own free will. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. Remember in our very first chapter, um, Fred passed with the young boy who'd been underneath the, the horses. And we talk, he, he described him as a cherub. He looked beautiful. And everyone said, well, why does he look so good? <laughs> and I said, because he hasn't activated his own will yet very much. He's been lived in you know, pushed into this horrible situation in life. And so there's very little penalty on his soul thus far. The more we activate our own will, that's when the penalty starts coming, you know, back to us. So in the, as Trevor points out, the law of attraction is going to be giving us a lot of opportunities to see the errors. Now, what happens is very often we have an emotional investment in holding on to the error, don't we? So even though it, we get the opportunity to see that in one way, in another way, in another way, there's an emotional investment. So even though it entered us as a child and um, while we were still not very aware of our own will and not activating it, the penalty doesn't lie with us. If we maintain that um, error-based justification of our error, of our harm of other people or even ourselves, then the penalty begins to lie on us. And that's because, as I said in Cobra, I think that that's loving because God wants us to understand love. And he wants to act on that emotional investment that we have. He wants to act on it so that we, that we can release it and actually come to understand more of what love is. Diana? So Mary, even though um, we haven't activated our own will, the law of attraction would still be working on the injuries from our parents in our soul as that young child, wouldn't it? Yeah, it yeah. would even so, be. Well, it would be acting for our parents as well, remember? Yep. Pretty yep. constantly. Yeah. So in a sense then, it's still we're still reinvesting in a belief that we don't even have a conscious ability to understand our soul is... Yeah, is and, and, and the, in that case, the penalty still isn't lying with us. It's only when we activate our will. Yeah. yeah. But very often it's our investment into our mother or our father's approval or something like that. That means... Because if you think about it, if I'm seven and um, I've been taught all black people are bad 
And then I go to a church service or somewhere else, I go to my neighbour's house and they say, you know, that's not true. We're all God's children. Now, if I was completely open to that, I would just have a big cry and go, oh, that's great. I love that. You know, thanks for giving me the truth about that. But very often that doesn't happen because we have an investment in, oh, what's mum going to do or dad going to do if I actually start believing this? And this is what God wants to help us work through as well. Yeah. So is that, was that what you were asking, Di? Or, or is that clear? Uh, I guess, but it is clear. No, it yep. is clear. That's yep. fine, Mary. Thanks. Cool. Cool. Okay. Uh, Geraldine? This just keeps coming up for me, so I'll just say it. Um, You're actually feeling pretty um, angry <laughs> today? Uh, no, f- well, I'm feeling I've got a lot of grief up for me. Yeah, um, I guess the feeling I feel is like irritation with me a lot. So, oh. Yeah. But please go ahead. I'd... Okay. Um, yeah, it's about the word penalty. Um, I just, I, I'm feeling, um, I guess, a certain maybe reaction to that word. Um, and, and I just wanted to say, I just wonder, for me, you know, I'm dealing with the punishing God thing and, you know, uh, I'm coming to that sort of got cracks in it. And um, so I have an ex- experience sometimes of um, feeling that th- th- that God is, is a very loving God and feeling the um, a lot of, of love coming to me. Um, and sometimes I just flash on like this great awe and wonder of like wow um you know it's like all I guess all the punishing spirits around me take off for a little while and um I feel that this whole system is um is just incredibly beautiful um in that um we just get to learn um and find out yeah um but what love is and and this word penalty just keeps striking me as um that i don't know maybe it's for me i need a a reinterpretation of, of that word it's it seems to be at odds with what i'm sometimes coming to feel is is the well, reality of the system and the, the beauty of it and it doesn't feel like I, a I got penalty your point. as such but it feels Could like... Could I just cut you off? Yeah. Yeah, because I think you've, you've made your point uh, yeah, and I'm willing to speak to it. Um, I feel there's a penalty on our soul when we harm other people and ourselves. It's an immovable law of God. This is not a punishment. It's just something comes onto our soul that we need to clear if we're going to be in a condition of love. It's an immovable truth. And I, like, I understand that that brings up a lot for a lot of people. But I, I do see the love in that. Like I see there's a lot of love in that. Because God wants us to understand love. So um, I see that what else could he do to help me know love better? So, I guess that's all I've got to say about that. <laughs> yep, Lorleen. My suggestion is to allow the emotions that it brings up, Geraldine. The sense of rebellion in you about it. Yep. Uh, I'm just wondering if the word penalty, which we associate often with punishment... So because they're interlocked in our thoughts, we make penalty a punishing thing. So um, for me... I can see that as well. But I just... I don't feel like shifting on this point. No, no. No, no, no. I can can pander to your emotions and say, look, it's not punishing. Mm. It's really loving. Uh, But I think Fred's told us that, like, about 15 times already in the book. And I do feel there's a huge resistance in many of us to actually just facing that when we do things that are not loving, 
unloving things are in our soul. And yeah. that's a penalty. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that, Mary. I'm just saying that it might help uh, Geraldine. And that's why I'm stopping you, because oh. I feel like you're trying to help Geraldine feel better about the interaction I just had with her, when I was just saying, look, I think we need to face this, and I think there's emotions there for her and for many of us, and let's just face it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, sorry to cut you off, but I feel it's the most loving thing at this point. <laughs> Nina? Um, one of the things that struck me in the chapter was how they... It would have appeared passively watched the woman in her struggle and it was clearly stated that no one came to support her and they were able to rest with absolute faith that God had put a structure in place that would rectify yeah. her condition. Yeah. They really understood a lot about love. Well, they do, don't they? About how, how can I help her if she doesn't want to face anything? The only thing that's going to help her is love and truth, and she's already rejecting those gifts. So the only thing we can do is allow the loving um, uh, framework that God's already put in place to guide her to a place where she's going to want that. And there's a beautiful quote that says... Um, We know, uh, we know it. It is the one great law of life that you will find is everywhere in operation here. It should be so on earth, but the multitude of the worlds of men have become the grave of knowledge and the light of inspiration has been van vanquished in the darkness of such a sepulchre. <laughs> sepulchre. <laughs> um, you, will, you will not find much preaching here. So no one's following her with a book going, it's going to be, just read this bit, you know. Um, we will not find much preaching here as you are used to understand the word. With us, to preach is to act. And all action has love for its incentive, since we have practically learned that he who dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Isn't, that's just a masterpiece. In, it's worth reading the book just for that paragraph, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, so exactly as you were pointing out, Nina, like they understand very well what's going to be loving and what's not and nobody's like trying to placate to her or sympathise with her because they know that actually she needs to face something. Yeah, yeah. Joy? Thanks. How am I going for time? Yep, good. Time. Um, I do love, though, too, that um, there's always somebody of a higher condition willing to come and visit everybody to give them whatever encouragement that they can yep. to see if they are ready to move on. What's it based on though? Love. Desire. Oh, and their desire. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful, isn't it? There's, as he points out, there's absolutely everything done to ensure the care. And I suppose the soul. same thing's true here as well because it would be based on the law of attraction. Like if the desire's there, then someone is going to show up. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, Renee told me one week that, well, how come it's hard to know truth here? And I said, well, it's about desire. You know, don't think that God's holding back. They're going, no, you're on earth. You're not getting any till you come here. <laughs> <laughs> he's waiting for the magic desire, you know. <laughs> when the desire's there, he's there in a minute. Yeah. And then sometimes we go, oh, no, I didn't want, no, what? I I, can I take it back? Yeah. <laughs> it's too much truth, yeah. So, yeah, don't underestimate the law of desire because the law of attraction is always in operation. But when we use desire, we really ramp up the law of attraction's actions. It's yeah. the next chapter. Yeah, the next chapter is really good too, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, someone else had their hand up. Karina? And there, there's a lady in front of you that we were going to go to before. Do you still have a question? Okay, sorry. We got shifted sideways on the forgiveness. Uh, just back to the penalty thing. Yep. I'm really glad you didn't back down and I had an experience. <laughs> I don't even think we need to talk about it much more. No, but I'm just going to say I had an experience this morning. Of, I've resisted something for so long and denied it for so long and I finally faced it today and felt the penalty and the relief was so huge and I feel that is how God's going to teach me love. Yep. And one part um, in the book, he says that people will in turn come to it. I mean, we might resist 
and resist and resist, but in time that lady will. It's just the way God's law, laws work. Well, in time God's that lady will come to it. Yeah, yep. Yep, that's true. Be careful about making excuses for putting off the, <laughs> the desire, but it's true. God's, God's designed everything that she would come to it at some point. Um, but... I guess what I'm reflecting on is sometimes it's easy to let ourselves off the hook and go, well, I'm just not ready yet. I'll get to it. And there's a lot of unlovingness in that position. Can you see that? Like saying, well, everyone else can put up with my unlovingness because I'm not ready yet. So I, I'm not sure that's exactly what you're saying, but I just feel it's important to raise. Yeah. I agree. Thank yeah. you. Uh, if we go to Monique and then to Pierre. Hi Mary, just wondering if um, um, in that explanation um, Corny's question was answered about um, the things that were done in ignorance, exact no penalty. I didn't understand if it was answered. Um, well, yep, it was answered probably more in full last week in the last discussion. But le let's talk about it a little bit more. Basically, I feel that it's very hard for us to be ignorance, ignorant of something that we've done wrong. And we usually get around it by saying, by being willfully ignorant, by ignoring our conscience, the pangs of our conscience. So um, in the Paget messages, it says that there is a penalty for everything we do out of harmony with love. And I agree with that because God wants us to understand love. Why would he, he say, oh, you didn't know, so I won't teach you that bit. He, he wants us to know. So there always is, but the truth is that most often we have an awareness. Like for the little boy who's raised a racist, there's no penalty on him while he's still under the will of his parents. But as soon as he gets older and it's brought to his attention that this thing is out of harmony with love and he willfully ignores that, the penalty starts. Is that clear? The only way, and I gave the example last week um, off the top of my head, was about a postman. A postman who collects the mail, okay, you make, a, you make um, a bomb and you put it in a package and you take it to the post office. The, post of, the postie picks it up and delivers it to... Sorry, Raj is out. <laughs> You're just in my line of sight. <laughs> Sis is moving. <laughs> Let's say Dave. You make it and we deliver it to Dave. Now... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dave just said to kick you. To, anyway, that was funny. Yeah. <laughs> so the postie has no idea what's in there. He's completely ignorant to what's going on. He's actually enacting um, an unloving act towards Dave. The, all of the penalty rests with the, the person who made the bomb because he's totally ignorant. Can you see that? Mm. He doesn't know what's in it. Yeah, yeah but um, when it's, it's done in ignorance, exacts no penalty. Like, yep. to There's my understanding, what you're saying is that there is a penalty in our ignorance. If we are willfully ignorant, that's very different to ignorance. We've made a decision to be ignorant, which means we're not actually ignorant. Mm -hmm. It's not clear. <laughs> Ask what, what's not clear. That, like I understand what you're saying, that there's an, uh, we feel in our soul, um, our conscience will tell us when, when we've done something wrong, like you said, with the abortion. Yep, and so in that case we're not ignorant. That's, yep. Yep. Yep, S yep. go on. So there's times when we're ignorant and we have no idea that we've done anything wrong that we won't exact a penalty. I thought we just, it's either black or white. You either are loving or unloving. If you're loving, there's no penalty. Unloving, there's yeah. a penalty. So can you see with the post office, the post, postman, Yeah. he's not being unloving, is he? He's actually doing his job, which oh. is loving. And so oh. there's no penalty on him. So he's the, only, he's the only one. Yeah, he's the only one that doesn't have a penalty on his soul. He's the one who's truly ignorant. Yes. Now, the person who is under the free will of their parents and enacting something in error, there's no penalty on them. They are also ignorant. 
Mm-hmm. However, once they reach an age where they're activating their own will, they would have had a lot of experiences of this being pointed out to them, which they have chosen to ignore, therefore becoming willfully ignorant, not truly ignorant. Mm. There is a penalty on their soul. Mm. Thank you, Mary. Is that clear now for everyone? Yeah, I'm sorry because I'm sort of tacking on to the discussion we had last week so as not to be too repetitious, but I understand it was with a different group and so that maybe is making it a bit out there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, is this about the same question? Yes. Yep. Yeah, okay. It's exactly about that. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's related to a personal experience. I've been teaching some natural love stuff, and I had the feeling it was good. I, I was doing good, mm-hmm. maybe for wrong reason, but I was feeling people... Um, I had like good feedback, it was, it was loving, until the moment I discovered there was some untruth. Mm-hmm. And so what, what's your me. question? Well, my question is, um, in the first uh, stage, was I, uh, were I uh, willfully ignorant? <laughs> I just, yeah. Well, I guess you could say you were ignorant, but you are no longer ignorant. God has shown you through the law of attraction. And so I stopped a teaching. Yeah. No, then I decide I cannot do that anymore because yep. it feels it is untrue. Yeah. And, and what else would you do if you were repentant? Well, it's feeling about all the, um, the damage I did to the people. Mm-hmm. Um, um, uh, yeah, I, I've been feeling quite a bit about that. Mm-hmm. And there's all those other stages that we talked about as well. There's a couple more stages that you would go through as well to be truly repentant. Yeah. 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 Renee? Um, yeah, I feel that um, I've spent a lot of my ch- teenage years being so rebellious. My conscious knowing that I was doing things that I, like, shouldn't be yeah. but still went against myself so many times against myself and like have done so much damage I still to this day do it and sometimes go no nah, and I've done that and not don't I don't feel good about that but yeah. I have got so much repentance yeah. to get, get through with God this time yeah and yeah, yeah. and um, knowing that like the damage like there's so much damage I've done to myself it's very strong in me and it's um, yeah, it's quite a huge huge thing <laughs> yeah okay i'm going to stop you and ask you about what's the emotion driving you to share your stories all the time because it's in emo- I, uh, this is where i struggle because i want to hear from you guys and your experience okay but sometimes when when some of you share it's like wow yeah and i can feel everyone kind of engage with that and then sometimes there's another emotion driving your sharing and it's a little bit about wanting to like kind of get validation or attention or things like that and when we share from that place the whole group just kind of goes oh because they can sort of feel they're being taken from so i'm just bringing this up because i feel it's something for you to look at renee like there's there's often a feeling like oh can i just share this thing and i i love everyone sharing but when we do it from a place of because I, I want to feel okay about this thing or because I want to know I, I want you to know I get it or you know all of that immediately there's a desire coming out of you that I give you something or the group give you something and it's kind of more of a taking can you see what I'm saying yes 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 I love you sister yeah <laughs> let's yeah. move on yes thank yep. you yes. okay Sarah at the back Um, one of the emotions that came up for me um, about responsibility for sin, which yep. was this awful realisation about punishment and the fact that it's okay to punish if they've done something bad to me. Um, so that's the feeling that you have inside of yourself? Yeah, and I yep. still have, like, in my head I try to get away from it, but that's the emotion that I have. Like, if someone's been unloving to me, then it's okay for me to keep punishing that, yeah. even with just withdrawing my love or something yep. like that. Yeah. Like, even to the point where where the mother 
walks away, like I do have this feeling that, well, she must have done something bad, so she deserves punishment. It's this awful feeling that, yeah. that yeah. someone deserves punishment because they've and done something unloving. Yeah. And so, Sorry, go ahead. Sometimes I pray and I feel about Jesus, particularly in the first century, being whipped and just loving them and forgiving them in that place and I'm like (laughs) you know sometimes I try to imagine myself in that place and I'm just you know yeah so far from there but yeah do you know your investment in holding on to the desire to punish Sarah it's about not wanting to feel feel the pain yeah that you have as a result of what someone's done to you yeah and so then we go Yeah. I'm righteous in being able to be angry at them <laughs> yeah, and punish exactly. them. So righteous. Yeah. It's yeah. A, um, yeah. a just thing too. It's like, yeah. The injustice and all yeah, of that. Justice. Yeah, justice. And it's justice. very self-reliant, isn't it? It's saying, I have yeah. to exact justice, not God. Yeah. It's yeah. terrible. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. It's good to feel that. It's good to recognise Good to recognise that, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. 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 Lauleen sent me a beautiful email about, do you remember a few weeks ago we talked about the... Um, um, she said she'd had a realisation about a lot of Chinese girl babies in the spirit world being earthbound. And I said to all of you, well, what does that make you think about in terms of your own lives and your own how you might be contributing to that? And it was a big question. Everyone kind of went, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but Lorleen wrote, do you want to read what you wrote, Lorleen? Okay. Because I thought it was very beautiful and it kind of relates to this when we hold on to this desire to punish. Um, uh, She says, When you ask the question, what part do I play in this situation, referring to the earthbound spirits influencing the babies? I was blank with trying to connect to the killed Chinese babies, connect them to my life. But after reflection, this came to me. The reflection of this question will reveal that I've only just begun my journey of taking responsibility for what I do to others. That is, the rage and anger that I deny in myself is a reflection of the degree of revenge I want for my sufferings. The greater the hurt I feel, the greater my desire to punish and avenge for myself and the general plight of women, especially the babies. This justification, my rage, locks me into denying my own terror and grief so I can continue my rampage by projections and actions in my sleep state. Because of this denied and unreleased murderous rage of the injustice, unfairness, the hatred for male domination, I'm then inviting the increased influence of my raging sister comrades. This in turn reinforces the cause for revenge by domination, power and punishment to all men. My desire to punish then causes the men, all men, to feel more pain and then more hate towards women. By choosing to delay, deny my true feelings, I encourage the malevolent female spirits to continue to become more evil and to degrade my soul condition even more through acts known and unknown to me. The cycle continues. So who in the end becomes more evil or equally evil? The original perpetrator or the perpetrating? The choice is mine. And I think that indicates that Lorleen is a little bit further than just her initial reflections. <laughs> That's almost exactly what I was referring to when I said, well, what, what, what part do we have to play in that? And thank you for sharing that. It's very... Um, I feel there's just an amazing amount of self-reflection you went through and, like, what a gift to now start to change that process. Yeah. How does everyone else feel about that? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty spot on, pretty powerful. Yeah, yeah. So this is what I feel like about myself even in my desire to hold on to punishment or rage, all of these things. It doesn't just affect this little old soul. There's a lot, like who said earlier, we live in an interactive universe, you know. We're all interacting all the time and what I project out there does have an effect. Yeah, so beautiful. Thank you, Lorleen. And... I feel that the original perpetrator is always going to have more soul damage because part of your... You have to own your desire to avoid this pain, but that pain was originally put into you by a perpetrator. 
And this is where perpetrators also, as perpetrators, we need to look as well. Because every time we've perpetrated something against somebody else, yes, they can use their will in avoidance of that, but who put that thing into them in the first place? That was us. And so, yeah, yeah. I love, I love reflecting about repentance, guys, and I, I love how much you guys are starting to reflect about it. Um, I think it could be indicative of the fact that when I started this group, I, I was tossing up, I was like, I'd love to run a study group on repentance or on <laughs> RJ Lee stuff, and it seems to be merging together. <laughs> yeah. All right, before we finish, Joy, yep, we're still on. Thanks. Just reflecting on what uh, Lord Lean's shared with us, and that is that that's the only way that we can change things on earth, just taking our own responsibility for my part in what's happening. And that's the only... Because we can't influence anybody else. We, it that's starts right. with us, and that's, that's right. all we can do. And actually, you know, we often say, that's all I can do. Yes. But holy mackerel, like... It's everything. Don't underestimate the power of that. Yeah. Like the power of love. Mm. How much is, like, the love from somebody, the love from mm. AJ, how much has that changed mm. your life? Mm. You know, how much is the love from that daughter to her mother going to change her life? Like, mm. it's, the, it's the, you know, this is my theme I wrote about in the book. It's the most powerful force in the universe, mm. you know? So what, what more powerful could we do than look at ourselves mm. and act mm. on what we see, you know? Not just look at it and berate ourselves or go live in the fear or it's too hard or I can't take a risk or I'm not good enough yet, but to actually look at ourselves mm. and don't get caught up in self-punishment but go, how am I going to act? Mm. How, is this gonna, how am I going to live in faith of what I know about God in order to change? And this is where mm. faith becomes so important. It's if I, if I know, if I have heard this about God, if I act in faith on it, then I'm going to challenge my fears and challenge my false beliefs about it. But I can also receive the truth that it's actually true, which is going to empower me to act even more. Yeah, it's taking that action. It's having the courage to take that action after looking at ourselves. But also the other thing I realise is that it's so far away from waiting for others to act first yeah. or waiting for others yeah. to make it right for me. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I think about that as well, even in the early stages of my processing, you know, I want my parents yeah. to admit they're wrong before I work through this. Mm. Wow. I'm just putting my, I'm just delaying it based on their free will. Who knows when they're going to change their mind or, mm. you know, anyone who's harmed me. If I wait for them, mm. I just become passive again. And actually, I don't activate that real desire. Like, how many of you think about your processing and go, my desire is to be able to forgive everyone? <laughs> you know, that's my end goal. Because that's really what it's about, isn't it? I want to be able to love everyone equally, except for my soulmate. I want to love him more, you know, <laughs> or have a closer mm. connection with him. That, that was a revelation after reading this chapter was... If forgiveness can help somebody else, it's like, oh, okay, so who else can I forgive? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, which is lovely. It's just that we have to do it the real way and not the jumping over way. Yeah. Uh, Sarah? And then I'd like to just quickly, we've got still about 20 minutes, just talk a little bit about the other points in the chapter. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I might be skipping ahead. I was just going to talk right. about how Afra's faith was rewarded when he went to the top of the hill yeah. and the description of how he, you know, you can't even describe it, the sense and the um, the beauty and the sculptures, the thing that, the, that they've made, it's just, and he can't even describe it, and yet the way that he describes it, I just like, you yeah. know, your soul just sings and you can just see that his faith in, you know, in God, in a loving God is just brought him to that place. Yeah. So it's like, you know, faith, wow. Yeah. yeah, it's very beautiful. And that's something that I wanted to talk about. Doesn't he describe so well um, on page 43 how it's so impossible to describe how beautiful this is, you know? The, but he describes it really well, but obviously he says it's not doing it justice. But, um, you know, the, the analogy of the painting of the sunset versus the sunset, that was just, I was like, oh, that's amazing in itself. But, um, yeah, that his faith was rewarded. He had a pretty lonely, hard life on earth, but he held true to some certain principles about love 
and um, God. And he also really activated this desire to know truth. And because of that, it just happened for him. And is it in this chapter where, yeah, where he says, why did this happen to me? Yeah. He said, um, I can't find exactly where it is now, but like, um, how come I got to learn all of this all of a sudden, you know? And they said, well, because we saw you as you came through the mists and we knew this is exactly what you would love. Even before meeting your family, this is what you wanted to do, so we did it. And to me, that's just such an amazing um, description of how God acts on loving desire. If we bring our desires in harmony with love, wow, guys, we could do so much because God's going to be there with us going, okay, I'll give you the next bit. Okay, let's keep going with this, you know. Um, his whole universe is operated to, to help us in loving desires. So, yeah, yeah, pretty awesome. Was there anything else from the last part of the chapter that came up for you guys? So we've been through this process of seeing the woman and um, understanding about forgiveness and the penalty of sin. And then he takes him, doesn't he, up to the mount. And he gets to see all the paths leading to all the different spheres. And he gets to see a vision, which is really only probably a vision of maybe the third sphere. <laughs> and he, it's impossibly beautiful to him. And there's a beautiful thing that is said... Um, he's talking about the people there. Each possessed some power to augment the happiness of his fellow. The society of all was necessary for joy to reach its full ideal. I love that because I agree. Like, for everything to be at its full ideal, all of us, you know, are going to be in harmony with love and truth. And then we're all going to be our unique selves. None of us will be the same. And our happiness is just going to make each other happy. And then it's all just going to be like this perfect joy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I was thinking, wow, I completely deny my own power to make other people happy just by being myself. I have the opposite belief. If I be myself, everyone's going to be unhappy. Whereas it's showing us, no, when you're really yourself, everyone's going to be blessed by that almost, when you're your loving self. Yeah. Trev, you had your hand up. Just wait for the mic. And then we can go to Barbara, yep. The, the helpers that come to help um, Frederick, what sphere would they be in? Are they, are they celestial beings, do you think? No, no I don't even think they're there no, yet. No, I didn't think they were. No. Either, but, um. I think Eusmos is, because remember he's met Helen. She's still in the first sphere herself. Then Eusmos is just a little bit higher. Mm. And now he meets, um, well, in the coming chapter, we're going to see that he meets Kushna, who is um, like almost a um, overseer of a certain area where we're still in the first sphere. So he's still, he's still quite, yeah, but so, so massive in love but still not yeah. that progressed in love, so yeah. to speak. But, well, hmm. doesn't it blow you away, the amount of development yeah, the in love that's yeah. p- possible? And, w- you know, in the first sphere alone, w- what is possible and what is, you know, achieved? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's hard for me to, well, I'm sad about it, I've got grief about it, but just to really fully open again to that memory of the full possibility of love um, and what it's like. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Barbara? That was one of my questions, Mary. Um, Reading through this and um, his description, I was just wondering whether it triggers memories in you. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Which is why the first time I read it, I really struggled. Yeah. And almost sometimes when I read the, um, the description of the third sphere, I almost I have to be really humble or I want to get, like, resistive to it. I want to... Um, because I, there's such a feeling of loss about that and feeling that it's not like that here and of wanting to force it to be like that here rather than just grieve that, oh, it's going to take action on my part, it's going to take action on other people's part to bring that into being here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, darling, why do you... Give me truth. <laughs> I want it. Um, I was sort of concentrating on something else up there, but did I hear you say that Eusimus and Kushner and that weren't yet at one with God or weren't yet... Yeah, I thought that. Is that yeah, right? that's actually not true. Okay. Yeah. Um, the 
All of the spirits that he's working with are actually at one with God. Except for Helen. Except for his mother, who, who you'll meet at the end of the chapter. And uh, yes, Helen, and there's a few others, although later in the development they do become at one with God. Yep. But with Yusamos and Kushna and Mahiin and others that you will meet, they are all developed enough in love to actually become overseers of operations in okay. the lower spheres. Okay. And so many of their homes, what are called their homes in the books, are not actually their personal home, right. but rather the homes they visit uh, where they ha have care of those particular responsibilities. And in fact, now that you're saying that, I think it even says that later in the book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they, they are actually spirits who are hot, highly... All of them are at one with God, most of the ones that he's working with, and even the ones that are working in the hells, the ones that he does discuss things with who are working in the hells are actually also at one with God. But uh, there are others that uh, work in the hells, of course, and there are others that work in the different spheres that are not at one with God at all. So Yeah, okay, because they make reference to them as well, don't they? Yeah. With the mother, they say someone just a bit above her in development will help her. Yeah, yeah. Yep. 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 Thanks for clarifying. No worries, darling. I was getting a bit <laughs> lackadaisical at the end. <laughs> all right. Um, okay, any other reflections from the end of the chapter? Joy, yeah? a question about that. So do you have to be at one with God before you're in a position that you can use some of your power to help somebody else go to a higher level? No. Okay. So as we see with the lady who's in the hells, um, Yusmos says to Fred in that chapter that someone just a little bit above her in development will initially help her to come out of that place. And so it's because remember, let's think about this for us. Mm. Do we have to be at one with God before we can help someone else? No, no way. No, I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking more about he was able to give Fred some enough energy to go up and view the oh, higher okay. areas. Yep. Do you have so to be at one with God to be able to do that? To do that. I don't feel so either, but my soulmate might give me more truth about that. Is that... <laughs> Um, no, but you have to have a substantially uh, larger amount of yes. love than the person you're trying to lift. So, so, for example, if you were in the second sphere of development and you were trying to lift a person in the first sphere, it's highly unlikely you'd have enough love to do it, to lift them into the second sphere with you. So you have to have, be of substantially greater amount of love to actually lift a person into a sphere that's higher than their own development, temporarily. And my, my feeling about it, babe, is that you also have to be, and that actually goes against what I said before, so, yeah, I'm not really thinking about this. You have to be in a high... Like, so Yusmos took him to the third sphere. He can't be from the third sphere. He has to be from a higher sphere to lend the energy to bring someone to the third sphere. Yeah. So if I'd really felt about that answer, I would have known, yeah. And also the amount of energy required to do it is quite substantial. That's right. and, and also, um, you're not only... It's also, it also gets to be limited quite severely by the condition of the person you're attempting to lift. Because, uh, because what happens is they become so much more uncomfortable, as you can see in the book. Mm -hmm. Fred himself becomes more and more uncomfortable the higher he goes, and he actually wants to stop at some points. And, uh, and the reason for that is, is the person's own soul condition is so much in disharmony to that new level that they, they basically plead with the person, look, yeah. I can't go any further. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's Fred's openness and inquisitiveness, again, that helps him over, like, overcome some of that. And, yeah. Desire to be there. Cool. Di, you had a question? Or a comment? Yeah. No, I had a question. Yeah. And it's um, right at the end of the chapter. Yeah. Um, where he asks, why... What, Will you explain why I've been able to ascend so far? And um, the bit I wanted to ask about was, um, it says, um, um, da, 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 da. but that, that was high enough to make you understand, talking about the height at which he yep. ascended, that was high enough to make you understand something more of the power of love operating in another direction for the purpose of continually raising up the whole community towards God. Yep. So I wanted to ask... Is that God? Is that waves of God's love that are that is that power that's helping to raise it? Or no, no. Um, Yusmos is saying because remember, until now, Fred's been shown what happens to people 
coming through the mists, what happens with people meeting their loved ones and what happens with people who are actually probably going to go to a hellish place for a while. Eusmos is showing him in another direction God's love in operation. So going upward through the spheres, it, that's what he's referring to. I'm just showing you, Fred, in another direction what happens with God's love. Oh, thanks. Yeah, because I had the picture of this... And I thought, is that God's desire to, that might be, you know, desire for us to receive his love that might be working, but no, thanks for that. No, yeah, I think it's just that literal other direction. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Lorleen? Um, is this relating to now what other things we got out of? Yes. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's been occurring a lot is the question of how am I of service? Mm -hmm. And... Um, it's uh, this uh, through reading a lot of this I feel why can he serve so well and what am I missing about it and what I keep feeling is his um, his desire is is part of it but it's also based on love and um, he takes action and love and his all of those things being humble yeah. and it um, helps me to see where I'm actually, why I, I get the question of why am I self self absorbed? And he he's always thinking of others, and he's offering his gift so automatically. Whereas I'll think about it, and yep. you know. Yep. So um, I I felt that uh, his uh, naturalness or his lovingness uh, has been opening a lot of the understandings of why I am not of true service because yeah. true service comes from love yep. and I just thought well I'm just not you know how do I get to that so yeah. it's been helping me reflect on that yeah, yeah. awesome awesome yep me too a lot of um, as, as you know or some of you might know on the blog this week I'm reflecting on love every day and I kind of have in my head the things we're going to talk that I want to talk about and one of them is about what is true service it's always grounded in love and I think Fred shows us that he didn't make an excuse to, before he felt he could be loving. He just took action with desire. And this is the thing that I kind of keep bringing up is about desire. Grow your desire. If you don't have a desire, then look at the anger that's preventing the desire. Because this thing, I feel this thing called desire for God, desire to be loving, desire to love one another, that, that's the only thing that's going to get me there. I can't be half-hearted about it. And, and when I have, am starting to grow that love inside of me, I'll be naturally drawn to service. I won't have to think, oh, I should serve. It'll be like, oh, how can I serve? Yeah. yeah. And very often it's anger or hurt that we're holding on to that makes us feel like that punishing feeling that Sarah pointed out. And very often a lot of us have a sense of wanting to punish. No one was nice to me, so I'm not being nice to them, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. But I see lots of you beginning to activate your desire to serve as well, which is lovely. Yeah. Okay. Anything else from the chapter before we close? Uh, Pierre? Um, it's about... Um, my question, no, an observation um, he's doing when he's in this beautiful place or in the third sphere about all these colors and nationalities and yep. all these nations and I was wondering if um, it's still like that in the celestial uh, there is all this color and everything like that yeah, I think to an extent we may, we maintain our cultural well. I think it's very much based on desire and true personality that's expressed in the in the celestial heavens, you know. So it's kind of a place that transcends culture. It's it's who you are, and that's who you, who you're offering. In terms of how you appear, that's based on desire as well. So if you want to stay looking, you know. African, you will. If you don't want to, you won't. <laughs> you know, you've kind of transcended all that kind of earthly based stuff. And it's just that pristine soul that God created that's in full expression. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Something I loved that was shown in this chapter was that 
the spirit world and all these dimensions we go to is just as tangible as this is here, you know? It's not that harps and clouds thing, which is kind of exciting to look forward to. <laughs> all right, guys, I feel like we're flagging. Is there anything else or will we close for today? Yeah. Sarah? Sorry, just a clarification. Um, on page 46, um, they're talking about the vestibule of heaven and if this is but a vestibule, what will the glory of the inner temple be? And mm -hmm. Yusmos says, I cannot tell. Doesn't that sort of... Is, are they talking about heaven and wouldn't that indicate that Yusmos hasn't been to heaven? That, I mean, that's what I read from it. So yeah. So maybe he's not quite yet celestial, but he's obviously from a sphere much higher. Yeah. Well, then yeah. he talks about his longing, so it's like he's very close, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Is that what That's you thought? That's possibly the case. I, um, I also felt like Eusmos and, and all of these spirits who are in a high development of love, they're very humble about the fact that God's, you know, learning with God and growing with God is infinite. And so almost like when you... And in the next chapter, he talks a bit about that. Um, but just that there's always going to be more to heaven. There's always going to be a deeper place. And so I'm not sure if it means he's not quite yet a celestial or he's just being humble about the fact that, yeah. gosh, I don't even know how much better it's going to get. <laughs> yeah, well, I love how he says, I cannot tell was his modest reply, but it was filled with the music of such an intense longing yeah. as to waken echoes in my soul. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, isn't it? That longing feeling is what we all need to get there. Yeah. And he only said two words or three words, but he could tell. Yeah. He could feel his longing. Yeah. It's yeah. beautiful. Lovely. Okay, guys. A anything else? We'll wrap it up. Next week is Chapter 5. It's next Tuesday at the Diggers. And... I found at least 15 truths, 15 of God's truths in, ch in chapter 5. So um, my challenge, if you wish to accept it, is to find 10. Find 10. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. Well, it, I looked back and I went, oh, you know, maybe I'm putting too fine a point on it. Let's just go for 10. <laughs> All right. Thanks for your participation. Yeah.